Good morning. I would like to welcome John Redenvo to a conversation about spiritual intelligence and legacy. Some, for some of his background, he has been an avid dreamer in the past 30 years. He has furthermore recorded his dreams as well as interpreted dreams and visions for over 17 years. He has completed interpretations for national leaders, billionaires, heads of companies listed on the stock exchange, numerous business people, as well as Hollywood executives. He is the founder of the Strategy Group, a mentor group and think tank based in Redding, California of young up and coming strategists. And he's the founder of the Dream Lab, a company of dedicated interpreters based in Orlando, Florida that meets weekly to sharpen their skills and provide interpretations. Welcome, John. Thank you, it's so good to be here. Glad to be a part of today's show. Thank you so much. So one of the things that prompted this conversation is both a conversation that I had recently with my father about the idea of walking with God um, in the, the sense that we are not alone. And whether it's, you know, some of we had talked about regarding Psalm 23, or it's something that any of us can feel and sense, even if it's unseen, as something that guides us in our life. And I thought that you could speak further about, you know, what we have termed um, as spiritual intelligence, or also kind of what you have termed spiritual intelligence, in the sense of what can guide us that might not be visible to our visible, you know, eye spectrum or light spectrum, but is a guiding factor, whether it's the, the decisions we make or um, how we interpret messages that come our way. Um, so with that in mind, is there anything you would like to add to how you see spiritual intelligence? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, a lot of people um, feel like there's a guiding force or what I call the divine creative, um, which is the idea of intelligent design. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, and inventor, you realize that a lot of the actions that you take are with with a strategy in mind. And so when you look at the human being or the world or the earth, the universe, it's hard to look at it and not believe that an intelligent designer exists. So if you believe that, it's it's not too much of a step to take further to realize that that, whatever that being is, people call them, you know, I call them God, other people call them, you know, the divine creative or whatever <clears throat> can be involved in our daily lives. And so you wonder, well, well how could that be possible? And a while back, I, I had a friend um, who was working with me, who was a roommate of mine, and um, I had a question about a relationship. And I really didn't know what to do. And I was supposed to go on this trip and be a part of this conference. And this, this person was going to be there. And our last interaction didn't go like I had planned. And so I was just didn't know if I should go or if I should not go. And my friend was a very strong believer. And he said, well, why don't we just pray and ask God to answer you in a dream? And so I did, and I went to sleep that night, and I had five dreams about the situation. And I woke up, and I talked with my friend, uh, an African-American gentleman. He's still one of the best friends I have in life. And, um, <clears throat> and we, uh, we uh, just kind of worked through the dreams and got an interpretation, and I went, and some of the things happened exactly as I saw them. And so it kind of changed my mind about how I thought about dreams as just a random collection of ideas when you sleep at night to possibly a window into the heart or the mind of the divine creative that can help guide us in our daily lives. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that we had also talked about before this conversation is how many Americans, uh, as well as people around the world, are now tapping into and tuning into their dreams. And maybe it's because of the pandemic that they have slowed down to hear uh, more you know, in terms of their dream life at night, but, you know, would you speak into that a little bit? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> it's interesting because one of the things that that I've done is um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, um, and so I, one of the sources of truth that I have that I go look at is, is scripture, is the Bible, and when I look at the Bible, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I look for examples of what's happened in other places and other time periods and um, with like foreign kings that have have had wise men that surrounded them or you know work with them when they've had dreams or troubling dreams and if they've used these people like Solomon who is considered the wisest and richest king of all time and um, <clears throat> even the kings of, of you know old Babylonia like Nebuchadnezzar and um, and, and others and Pharaoh in Egypt 
and I found these stories. And, and so I've gone back and I've looked at them and kind of harvested them for truth and said, well, if it worked for them, couldn't it work for us? In terms and if, of how it can guide you. How it can guide us. Right. And what's really interesting is I've, because I work with a lot of CEOs and business people, you know, I have some real concrete examples of actionable intelligence that people got in a dream that they didn't understand. And then they met me and I interpreted them and it completely changed their life and spoke directly into certain business deals. That's fantastic. And, it, and it's so interesting because when I think about how spiritual intelligence can influence our decisions, ultimately then it, it impacts and influences our life legacies. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just, you know, what I call the intellectual intelligence that can come from universities and uh, formal education programs and case studies. You know, there's also the aspect of emotional intelligence, which I think is incredibly important in this world today. But I think a third component is the spiritual intelligence mm -hmm. that many people don't know about or they don't know how to unpack or how to give weight to in how it might influence them. But I am seeing people searching more and more around the world in trying to find answers, especially in the past 12 months, to make sense of um, the present moment, but as well as how do, how do they make sense of the future? And what are the best decisions that they can make moving forward? And again, it's when we can't always turn to our political leaders, who, who do we turn to, right? right. Yeah. So um, I and wanted, go ahead, please. In a time of instability and uncertainty is, is a time when, when I feel like God speaks more clearly because people are troubled. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes, again, written by King Solomon, that says, when the mind is troubled, dreams come. And a lot of people interpret that to mean the concept of what they call soul dreams, that if you have a troubling day at work and you go to sleep, you dream about work. And it's because it was on your mind. And I think of it differently. I think when your mind is troubled, when do you need God to speak to you more? You know, and so when we're having a pandemic and, you know, people are on lockdown and businesses are, are closed and kids can't go to school and everybody's wearing masks and they're talking about a vaccine and people are unsure and uncertain of the times and what's going to happen and travel's limited. It's a very troubling time that most of us have never, ever experienced in our life. Sure. And so what they've, what we've seen articles in psychology today, CNN are all talking about how dreams are exploding during the pandemic. And I believe again, because it's the divine creative reaching down into the affairs of men mm -hmm. to comfort people and to let them know to speak to them directly. Yes. So here's a question. Do you mm -hmm. think that the dreams people receive are like the pebbles that God leaves on the path for them to follow, to fulfill their soul purpose, or I might say their legacy? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've seen a lot of dreams directly related to what we call identity and destiny, like telling people this is a confirmation of the purpose of your life or a confirmation of what you should do next. Um, I'll tell you a really practical story. Um, <clears throat> I had a, a gentleman that I met at a business conference and he came up to me, heard that I was a dream interpreter. And, you know, I've also owned a finance company for 16 years. So I'm not one of those kind of weird, you know, people that just has flower plants all over my house and, you know, right. can't relate to, I'm not, I'm a businessman, you know, primarily what I do is business. I don't have a nonprofit or a ministry or a, you know, and anything like that. I'm not a shaman or, or whatever. I'm just a regular business guy who happens to believe in the power of dreams and to tap into them. So this guy came up to me. I don't know anything about him. His name is Emmanuel. And he says, I had a dream. I was at an airport. And I was going around a, a roundabout and there was a big lady in front of me and I couldn't get around her. I finally get around her and um, a, a airline flight attendant from United Airlines comes up to me and says, you're going to miss your flight. Here's a thousand dollar voucher, thousand dollar voucher. You're going to miss your flight. And he said, well, thank you for the thousand dollar voucher, but my partner's on the plane. I got to get to the plane. So he's running to the gate. He sees the gate in front of the in front of the gate he sees two asian ladies and two wooden doors mm -hmm. and and they close the wooden doors as he's running to the gate mm -hmm. and that's the dream so i'm meeting this guy about march of last year so the only thing we knew about the pandemic it was that crazy thing that was happening over in wuhan china that's that's you know it hadn't really touched america yet mm -hmm. and so i said and what what happens with me is when somebody describes a dream i'll hear things just in that internal voice in my spirit. And I said, when I heard the term Asian ladies, I heard quarantine. When you okay. said wooden doors, I heard the bamboo curtain. Okay. 
And I said, I don't know anything about you. At this time, I didn't even know his name. I knew the 20 seconds he told me the dream. And I said, here's what I feel. I feel like you're trying to do business in China and it's, it's not going to happen right now. And um, <clears throat> he was trying to raise a million dollars from overseas. He had it committed, um, a soft commitment from China for a million dollars of a $3.6 million raise he was doing. And when, as soon as the pandemic hit, everything dropped out and he couldn't even get a hold of his, his Chinese counterparts. Sure. And, and so I said, well, here's what I think the answer is. I feel like um, what God is saying is that you need to think demonstratively bigger in your business. In fact, you need to think 10,000 times bigger than you're thinking now. And that's from a verse in Psalms that says you'll have a 10,000 fold increase on your flocks and your herds, which flocks and herds is attributed to ranchers or marketplace people, business people, right? <clears throat> and so uh, he says, well, great. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can I stay in touch? Absolutely. A week goes by, this guy calls me freaking out. Can, can you be on, in my C-suite? Can you be on my board? Can you consult with my company? And I, I'm like, whoa, whoa, what, you know, I met you one time. I interpreted one dream for you. Like what happened? Well, that's the and trust. I just want to key into that and highlight that for a moment. That's the trust that when you're willing to speak truth and deliver it without fear of, will I offend this person or, or will I not impress this person? You're just delivering it. Go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And, and so I just said, I said, well, Hey, um, I said, what happened? And he said, <clears throat> well, remember the dream? And I said, yeah. He said, remember how you said I should think demonstratively bigger 10,000 times more? I said, yeah. He said, I was walking into a meeting with one of the largest financial institutions on the planet and they have a $10 billion hedge fund. And I walked in and I was gonna ask them to fund a million dollars of my $3.6 million project that had fallen out from the other investors. But as I was walking in, I just felt in my spirit what you said, think 10,000 times bigger. So I went, instead of going up to the boardroom and to the board at the boardroom to make my presentation, I sat down and I looked at them and I said, what if I bought you guys out? And they're like, what? I thought you were here to have a conversation about getting funded. And what I didn't know is this large financial institution was in the middle of a merger with one of the largest financial institutions in London. And they have one asset, which is this hedge fund that is just bleeding capital because it's so top heavy. And so it's a toxic asset and they want to dump it, but they can't tr try to do that in the midst of this merger because they'll blow the merger. And so they wanted to sell this hedge fund, but they couldn't tell anybody. And this guy walked in and said, how about I buy your hedge fund? And they're just like, how did you know? Where did you hear about this? And what ended up happening within like several days, they were putting a deal together where they were going to buy the $10 billion hedge fund for $10 million. It was almost like a divine appointment. Keep going. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I said, wait a minute, for, did you say $10 million? And they said, yeah. I said, didn't you have a voucher in the dream for a thousand dollars? Yeah. And I said, 10,000 times increase. So a thousand times 10,000 is 10 million. Mm -hmm. And didn't you say that you were buying this hedge fund for that was worth the, all the assets, you know, it was a portfolio of other people's assets, but all the assets combined, you know, as a management portfolio were worth 10 billion. They said, yeah. And, and I said, well, 10,000 times a million dollars is 10 billion. So literally within a week, the two numbers in the dream turned out to match exactly a number, the numbers in a deal that when he had the dream and talked to me, did, wasn't even on the table and didn't exist, but a week later, the whole thing was in play. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think that oftentimes people have dreams, but they sometimes are worried how much do they listen to them unless they can get an outside validation that it can be meaningful. It can be meaningful in its message. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they want the easy answers. And or they, or they, I'm sorry to interrupt, or they think intelligence will only come in one form. Yes. That's right. Very yeah. You know, there's so much, there's so many books out right now. One of the ones that I've read is called Stealing Fire. And it's the idea of all kinds of, uh, of Silicon Valley executives are microdosing psychedelics to spark innovation. Sure. Yes. And it's like, man, if people would understand the amount of inventions and Nobel prizes and entire industries that were launched because somebody had a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, the most re-recorded song yesterday by Paul McCartney in world history completely came to him in a dream 
the whole cosmetics industry was launched by an African-American girl who was literally one step, her parents walk off a plantation in, in America in the 1890s. Mm. Her name was Madam C.J. Walker and she had eczema. And so she prayed about it, went to sleep, got a formula for a face cream, put it together and became the first female billionaire in all of America and her mm-hmm. parents were slaves. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's success is incredible. When we're willing to slow down and listen and consider <laughs> other forms of intelligence. Absolutely. Yeah, and, I, and I'm aware that it might be hard to measure the quantitative, like, you know, how do I know that that's true? And, and it's, I think it's very interesting. And, and I wanna throw the statistic out there. We haven't talked about this before, but um, I think with business coaching, which I might call a blend of in- intellectual intelligence as well as emotional intelligence training within that coaching advisory sphere, is that I think it was uh, the last figure was about a $10 billion industry. But if I think about technology, it was, you know, 900% more. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder how willing people are now, you know, even with the conveniences of technology to also rely on something that might not be so easy if we have to slow down and listen to something that might not be promoted, you know, in mainstream media. Right. Well, again, I think if, if you look at the amount of people in the tech world that do things like go to Burning Man, mm-hmm. so they can get into the what they call the flow state. Yes. They can work for forever. And so they can have these groundbreaking ideas and innovation. I think if they're willing to do that and, and some of the harm that psychedelics can cause to your bodies and, and different kinds of drugs, if, they, if they're just willing to take a chance and start dreaming, asking God, God questions even before they go to sleep, and then writing their dreams down and seeking answers. I, I think it'll be probably the newest thing going when it comes to innovation. And probably much healthier in the long yeah, run. Probably much healthier. Yeah. So that brings me to my next question about myths and realities around dreams. What do you think some are the what do you think some are the myths? Yes, yes. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to ask. What do you think some of the myths are? Well, that's a really interesting question because there's a lot of people, um, there's dream interpreters in that do biblical dream interpretation. They tend to be Christian. Some of them are pastors or ministry people. There's new age uh, people that, that do it as well. There's um, the uh, psychotherapy guys like uh, Carl Jung and uh, uh, Sigmund Freud who kind of fathered the idea of looking at dreams as a way of getting into your psyche and finding out what your subconscious is telling you. Um, <clears throat> I know that there's been a lot of studies about that done. Uh, what I haven't seen is I haven't seen the miraculous breakthroughs in the new age or in the, in the psychotherapy methods of dream interpretation as I have in, in what I call the Joseph method or the, uh, the word of knowledge method, which is just training your voice, training your, your mind to hear things, to be open to hear things from the divine creative when you ask him questions, particularly about a dream. Mm-hmm. And so one of the myths- When you that ask out, for that guidance, keep going. The guidance. One mm-hmm. of the myths that's out there is the source of dreams. And again, I go back, I, I see the Bible as a, the ultimate source of truth. And so I go back to that. Um, I know other people subscribe to, to different things, but that's what I look at. And so there's a myth that dreams can come from anywhere. They can come from your soul. They can come from the devil or evil spirits. They can come from God. Um, In my experience, I haven't found that to be true at all. And in the Bible, I haven't found any basis for that argument. What I have found is God says, I will speak to you in dreams in, in, in scripture. And so what I've found is even some of the worst nightmares that people have had that they think, well, that was an evil dream. And that was... I was being harassed by some evil force or whatever. When we break it down and we actually dissect the dream and we interpret it, it tends to be a very, very profound message for their life. So one of the biggest misconceptions or myths is that dreams can come from anywhere. And I believe they come from one source and that's the divine creative. It's like what what, uh, hackers or programmers call the zero day, which is the back door into any program. It's like, I believe it's God's back door into our hearts, our minds, and our spirits where he can speak to us directly at night when our visual brain is completely shut off from all of the constant barrage of marketing and media all throughout the day. And he can get a message to us directly. And I don't feel like in, by what I've seen and observed through years of doing this, I haven't found a dream or a nightmare that we couldn't interpret. And I haven't- Break found, it down for the value in it. Yeah. And I haven't found a nightmare that wasn't a strongly worded message from God. So 
So I believe that they come from God. <clears throat> and I think it's really important to, again, um, consider what we can learn from our dreams mm -hmm. compared to just thinking, um, you know, oh, it was like our intu intuition. It didn't mean anything. And then it gets written off when in reality, it could be a message that's knocking. And it's first, it's a whisper, then it's a river, then it's a tsunami trying to get our attention yes. and tell us something. Yes. So I, I want to um, ask you for a moment, and I realize there's going to be listeners around the world that may not be within the, the Judeo-Christian beliefs. And so their culture might have their own stories about mm -hmm. dreams. But I wondered if you could talk about two specific stories uh, first, um, Nebuchadnezzar and, and the pride, but also Joseph. And I, I just wrote some, wanted to, I wrote something down. I just wanted to bring it up. So it was a farmer who went before a king. And when he told his brothers about it, they became jealous, threw him into the well, then sold him into slavery. But because of this, he meets people along his journey. And his dreams were a catalyst for him to achieve his destiny or legacy. Um, but it was due to his knowledge in a language that he was able to interpret. And I wondered if you might speak further about that story because I kind of just. Yeah, that's fascinating. So Joseph was uh, the son of Jacob, who was also called Israel. He was one of 12 sons. He was the youngest son and he got thrown in a well because he had two dreams as a kid. And that the dreams were that his uh, the sun and the moon and the stars were bowing down to him. And <clears throat> the sun, the moon and 11 stars, he had 11 brothers. So they're like, wait a minute, you think we're going to bow down and serve you? You know, what are you thinking? And then he was also, he was a farmer and a rancher, and he had a dream of 12 sheaves of wheat. And he was the one in the center, and the 11 other sheaves were bowing down to him. Probably not the thing you want to tell your older brothers. So they got mad. They got jealous. His father favored him. He gave him a coat of many colors, and, and there was a lot of favoritism there. And, uh, and so they decided we're going to kill him. And so one of his other brothers said, you know, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him down a well. And they threw him down a well. And then a caravan of, of slave owners came by and they said, you know what, let's make some money. Let's sell him into slavery. And so they sold him into slavery. He went off to Egypt. Um, he ends up in, in prison. And in prison, um, the, the he's king- really, He's really going to get tested then. Go ahead. He's really going to get tested, right? <laughs> he ends up in prison and the king sends uh, the, the cupbearer and the baker. He got mad at him one day and sent him to prison. And the two of them both had a dream the same night. And they said, we don't have anybody to interpret our dreams. And he said, tell me your dreams. And they told him the dreams. And the one he said, you're going to be executed in three days time. And the other, he said, you're going to be restored to your position. And when you're restored to your position, don't forget to tell the king about me because I'm here unjustly. I, I, I was, was innocent of what they're charging me with. And so exactly what he said happened. The one was, um, you know, he had a dream about baskets of wheat. The other one, the cupbearer had a dream about um, vineyards and, and wine and, and uh, grapes. The cupbearer was restored to his position. The baker was beheaded. Um, <clears throat> and then two years goes by. And two years later, you know, the guy had forgotten about it. The pharaoh that night has two dreams back to back. And they're about wheat and they're about cows. And he can't find any of the wise men or, or the astrologers or, or any of the enchanters, the magicians that can answer the question, what do these dreams mean? And so suddenly the cupbearer is like, oh my gosh, I forgot I had a dream two years ago when I was in prison. There's a guy that interpreted my dream and exactly what he said came true. Go, go find this guy. So they pulled him out and they said, here's the two dreams. What do they mean? And Joseph broke down each of the symbols. He said, here's what the seven lean cows mean, the seven fat cows mean. Then he said, here's what the whole dream means. It means there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. So you need to prepare for the famine. And then now here's what you should do. You should appoint a person to manage the control of foodstuffs in our country to be able to survive the seven years of famine. So he gave them the, the interpretation of the symbols, the interpretation of the whole dream, and then the actionable intel, which is what, what should the response be? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting because again, growing up, he was a farmer and a rancher. Mm -hmm. He had a dream about wheat when he was a kid. The two dreams that he interpreted in prison were about grapes and wheat. And the dreams that the Pharaoh had were about grain and were about ranching. And so six of the five dreams that Joseph interacted with in his life had to do with agriculture and farming. So sometimes God will speak to somebody, not just in a language maybe that they could understand, but in a language that he's going to send someone to them to interpret their dream that that person will understand. And a lot of time he brokers a relationship 
just like he did with me and that hedge fund manager. He brokered a relationship with, with us. And so now whenever that guy has a dream, whenever his wife has a dream, he'll call me and he'll say, hey, I, I want to get your thoughts on this dream. And so we have an ongoing relationship based on that one, you know, several minute interaction we had over a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing because uh, I, I think one of the things we've talked about before this conversation is uh, throughout history, many political leaders um, since the, the time of Sumeria or before Christ have relied on um, advisors, sages, whatever label uh, we could give it to provide them with clarity of, you know, how do I proceed forward? How do I make sense of, you know, what's in front of me? Because you know we we can't always walk in their footsteps to understand the pressure or the responsibilities that are on their shoulders at at you know any age that they might be. Yeah, absolutely, and and I, I subscribe to what I call the idea of ancient councils, and it's just what you said back in the day. They had a whole crew of wise men, and they were advisors, but they were advisors that were able to tap into what I call the the righteous or the spiritual arts, the spiritual seer arts. <laughs> So typically, um, even though there's been presidents that have talked to, whether they're prophetic people in the Christian realm or astrologists or psychics or whatever, that have been used even in modern day America, they typically don't have a board of directors or a group of wise people around them that tap into the spiritual side of, of intelligence. And I think it's something that's needed. I've been in a position um, over the last uh, two years in particular where one of the direct advisors to President Trump is a good friend of mine, and he's an avid dreamer, and he understands the importance of dreams. And so when he would have dreams, he would send them to me. Mm. And there were certain instances where I would put together a report. Um, it's a very professional report. It's actually modeled after the president's daily brief. It has a cover page. It has a back page. It has exactly what I said. You know, we, we list the dream, the time and date, who had it. We pull out all the symbols. We define all the symbols, we write a conclusive summary, and then we put uh, an intelligence and an analysis section in case there's deeper topics that we need to go into, like historical figures we need to explain. And then we have an actionable intelligence section. And um, some of these have even been used to warn higher ups in the administration. They've gone way over, over his head about um, nas potential national security events. Right, whether to go forward with the decision or to pull back. Right. Yeah. Right because it impacts other people's lives. Absolutely. And there's, there's, there's stories that I, I, I can't really get into the full context of what, where my friend even has had dreams that he's been then found himself in the Oval Office of the White House and said, hey, on this particular problem, what if we did it this way? They researched the idea, which he got in a dream, and within 48 hours, it becomes national policy. So there are our, our uh, policies and procedures that have changed in the federal government that I know of in the last several years, because people have been able to tap into dreams mm -hmm. to get a hold of the divine creative and to get answers for solutions that our government didn't have answers for. Yeah, and I think again, that, that goes to what I call truth being a superpower. Yeah, and I think that there are some individuals that are very hungry for truth today. They want to know the truth because they're trying to figure things out. I think that there's also obviously some people who don't want the truth, and that's okay. Um, but it's interesting because truth um, can be like, um, you know, um, something that can set somebody free, or it could be like a nuclear bomb going off if they cannot handle the truth that moment or if they don't want the truth and it lands on their desk and, and they don't want to face it or walk through it. So I just, yeah, it just, I just, I want to say that bit about truth, if you have any comments. Well, it's super interesting because I've had people that have had dreams that they were at a restaurant and it's like they were sitting up in the corner of a room and they saw like their business partner and somebody else having a conversation that they were surprised to hear. So, sometimes there are betrayals, sometimes they're just a piece of a conversation about a new project. And the dream would so affect them that the next day or several days later, they would go and they would confront this person. Hey, did you tell such and such about this or that? And they're like, how did you know that? Mm -hmm. And so this is where, again, dreams pull you out of the idea that they're just your mind backing up your own memories. Like people are able to predict things that happen in the future or to see things that are happening in real time in events that they're not part of and they're not there. 
I've actually had people that have been, had dreams about events that took place before their lifetime historically. Mm -hmm. Like one was um, the JFK assassination. Another one was JFK's inauguration. And they had a dream that they were there and they described historical events in detail that seemed to me very odd, the detail that they described in the dream. And so I went back and did a ton of research and looked up who was in the room when this conversation was happening? What was the picture on the wall? Where were people seated at the table? And found their dream to be exactly historically accurate. And there's no way they could know these things. So it's really interesting. It's like, okay, was, was God giving them a window into a past event? Or does God give us a window into future events? Right. I've seen both of those things happen. If for a moment, and I'm gonna go woo woo, if you could compare remote viewing with dream interpretation, what would you say? You know, it's a really, really interesting discussion because in the realm of, like you said, the Judeo-Christian kind of discipline <laughs> scripture. Yeah, when people are talking about remote viewing, they kind of get weirded out. Oh, that's psychics, that's this, that's that. I actually met the guy and spent 11 hours with him. The first conversation we had an 11 hour conversation. This was a guy, his name was Dr. Hal Putoff. If you watch the movie Third Eye Spies, I think it's on either Netflix or Amazon. This guy was a doctorate degree physicist at Stanford Research Institute. He was approached by the CIA mm -hmm. in the 1970s and they said, hey, there's a rumor that Russians are, the Soviets are using psychics to spy on America. You know, can you research this and, and prove that it doesn't work? Well, so he, he went into a program which became a 20 year program called Project Stargate where they looked into this and they found exactly the opposite was true. The idea that remote viewing works, that it works well, that coordinate remote viewing, like you can give somebody a latitude and longitude and they have no idea in their mind what exists at that latitude and longitude, but they can go there and they can describe buildings in detail. Some people can walk into buildings, they can see things. And so there's a lot of people that believe that, well, you're either tapping into good or you're tapping into evil. And I, I think it's a little bit different. I think there's a spiritual realm that people can tap into, whether they're a Christian, whether they're a non-Christian, and they can get intelligence and information. Um, I think they have to be very careful because when they open themselves up to spiritual- They have to, they have to be very strong. Go ahead. Strong, and they have to, to make sure that they know who they are and, and what they believe. Come back but to center. I talked to this guy in, in particular, and he was telling me stories about how they found airplanes that had crashed, you know, flying across Africa and the, the pilot bailed out, but the plane was on autopilot. So they don't even know what country it was in. It could have right. flown for another eight hours and they couldn't find it. And they had a remote viewer come in and they found it. They found plans of submarines that the Soviets were developing during the Cold War that they wrote out in detail. And then they found years later after the intelligence, the real intelligence kind of caught up with the, the remote viewing that it was true. And so I started sharing with him some stories of dream and dream interpretation. And he was just every bit as fascinated about the dream life you know, decoding the dream life that I do as he was about the remote viewing work that he did. And it's interesting, and I bring that up because I think that, um, again, people are searching for knowledge, but I think also um, if somebody doesn't have to have blind spots and they, that some of that information can be filled in, it just leaves them more equipped, more able, less vulnerable. Yeah, I think where people get into trouble is they have a belief system that tells them yes or no, I believe this or I don't believe this. And what I tell people is, whether you're a Christian, whether you're an atheist, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what your belief system is. Be open to the possibility that maybe there's a divine intelligent force that created all of us mm -hmm. and that he speaks to us in dreams. Like there's no harm, no foul for writing your dreams down and then going back and writing down all of the symbols, asking you know, the universe, again, I call them God, asking God, what do these symbols mean? And then trying to find out an, an actual antiquated, intelligent, actionable intelligence answer for a question they may have. And, and if, if they don't have to change their belief system to do this, they can just say, I just, I just say, try it. Just check it out. If you're looking for answers in your business, before you go to sleep, and almost every night before I go to sleep, I'll ask God a question. Mm -hmm. What do you say about this person? Or I just have a new relationship in my life. What do you, what about them? What about this business project? What about these partners? Or I'll ask them what, which direction should I go? And sometimes I'll have dreams directly related to that stuff. And sometimes I won't. And sometimes I just say, what do you want to talk about tonight? But every dream that I can remember, I'll write down as soon as I wake up. And I have probably 350 pages now 
of dreams that I've written down. And what's cool is they're on a searchable database. So I can go back and if I had a dream about my dad, which I did recently, I could go back and search the, the term dad and it appeared 88 times in my 350 pages of dreams. So it's something that God has talked to me about a lot. So then I can pull all these dreams out and say, is this talking about my heavenly father, my earthly father, perhaps a mentor or an advisor? And I can look at using the intelligence of all these other conversations, really know better of what the divine creative is trying to tell me. Absolutely. That's really powerful. Um, so question for you, what do you think about soul contracts? And the reason I bring that up is sometimes when I think about the, le the legacy that we're meant to fulfill on this earth, and when I refer to the word legacy, I don't mean just property and financial assets. I mean a greater purpose that we are meant to come here to do, to fulfill. And sometimes we can be sidetracked by distractions, obstacles, et cetera. Um, and so I just was curious, you know, what are your thoughts about soul contracts? Do you think that it's rewritten, pre-written? That's a really interesting question. You know, somebody just posted, I, I have a Facebook page called the Dream Lab. And so people join specifically because they have questions about dreams or they want to share a dream. And I have a group of interpreters that are on there. A lot of times they can find answers, but somebody just recently posted last night, um, the idea that if something forces something in your mouth or bites your mouth or something during a dream that it's a soul contract, it's an evil spirit, and then they have to wake up and they have to rebuke the evil spirit over their life. And um, when, when it comes to the dream world, I don't believe that. Here's what I believe. I believe that the keys to the projection room lie with the one that created us. Again, I believe dreams are a back door into our soul, our spirit, our heart, our mind. And so when people say, well, I had a horrible dream that my kids died or something, you know, th that must have been the devil. I just need to ignore that dream and play some good music and move on with my day. And I'm like, no, write that dream down too and seek out answers because if it was a dream that was very visceral that you remembered, that you can go back and look at it. People feel the same way about stuff that they call soul contracts. When there's an event that happens in a dream that they kind of get weirded out about and they're like, well, did I just make an, an agreement with an evil force? And what I believe is only God has the keys to the projection room. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that there's an evil force that can hop into your mind and say, you're going to watch Freddy Krueger on repeat all night long so I can torment you in the dreams. There's no biblical basis for that. And, and again, hijack the creator. Go ahead. You can't hijack the creator. So when it comes to soul contracts, particularly in dreams, um, I, I, there's no biblical basis for it at okay. all. And typically when people bring those dreams to me, I tend to believe that they mean something else. And what really happens is a lot of times it's people who don't have an understanding of dream interpretation. They're trying to explain something that they don't understand. It's like Freud. Or based on, I'm sorry to interrupt, based on their earthly wisdom. Based on their earthly wisdom. Freud's trying to explain using psychoanalysis. Well, if you dreamt about your teeth falling out, then it means that you're worried about your appearance and this and this. And, this. and actually it could mean something completely different if you believe that perhaps the dream didn't come from you, mm -hmm. perhaps the dream came from a source outside of you. And if you just take that on as even, even if you're not there, I wasn't there for a while. It wasn't until I met an executive at Facebook that had a really weird dream with a riddle at the end. And I started working with her to unpack this dream. And it was about uh, a, an ex-boyfriend and a very painful relationship. And she, she just got to the place where she, she just said, you know what, I, dreams are stupid. I wish I would never dream again. And I could hear, like, I felt like the Holy Spirit was wounded, like, oh, man. And then all of a sudden I heard in my spirit, I heard this, this verse in Song of Solomon, which is, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along, for behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers have appeared, the time of singing has come. And I'm like, what the heck does this verse of scripture have to do with the fact that this person doesn't want to dream anymore? You know, I didn't get it. Right. I heard really clearly dreams are the love language of God to his children. And I immediately said, now, wait, I've always heard that there's demonic dreams, there's soul dreams, and there's God dreams. And then I felt like, well, go look it up. You believe the Bible is a source of truth. Go look up the sources of demonic dreams and soul dreams. They're not in there. Mm -hmm. There's 21 dreams in the Bible. I'm actually about to start a, a Bible study on all 21 dreams in the Bible that I'm going to start in the next week or so with a friend of mine. 
And we're, we're doing that specifically because people ask me these questions all the time. How come you don't believe in demonic dreams? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them to what I use as the source of truth and to go back and, you know, all of the laws in America, our whole entire judicial system, all of even the laws in other countries, the constitution, the ideas of freedom and justice and liberty are all Judeo-Christian based. They all come from the scripture, from the Bible, our founding fathers, inventors, people that the guy that developed the Bohr model of the atom asked God to answer him in a dream right. how atoms were structured and he ended up winning a Nobel prize because he simply had a dream and recorded it. Mm -hmm. So God's hand has been through through all of history and not just working with inventors and innovators and entrepreneurs and business people, but with kings and founding fathers of nations. So if it's good enough for them, perhaps it's good enough for us to consider maybe right. God was this way. Right. Well, it's interesting. It, uh, it requires swallowing pride in order to seek, knock and ask right. again and again and again and again, and then be open and receptive to what we hear right. compared to thinking I have to know it all in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to circle back again about the truth telling bit, because sometimes and these uh, this comes from conversations I've had with different executives that work at family offices, that sometimes it can be hard to have a difficult conversation when somebody has to relay the truth. And I wondered if you might unpack for a moment if you've ever been in those shoes and how you dealt with it. So if you, yeah. let's say, have to deliver a message and you realize the other party may not want to hear what you have to say. And perhaps it might be due to ego, maybe it's due to a belief system or any reason on the landscape. What, please speak to that. Well, the thing that I love about dreams is a lot of times the truth comes in a supernatural way. And so if you're able to tell somebody something that you don't know about their life, it blows their mind. And an example is I have a, a, a very wealthy entrepreneurial friend of mine who actually lives in California on the West Coast. And, and she retired at like 30 and she's doing great. And she saw some of my postings on you know, my social media and said, hey, you, you work with people on dreams, right? And I said, yeah, she's a very accomplished businesswoman. And she said, I've had a recurring dream. And I'm like, ooh, recurring dreams are some of the most important. Again, it goes back to Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream. He had the same type of dream twice. And he said, what it means when there's a recurring dream is the matter is firmly decided and it will happen soon. So that's a piece of intelligence that I got studying the dreams in the Bible. When I know if somebody has a dream over and over again, it means it's very important. <clears throat> and so I asked this lady, she said, can I call you? Sure. I said, what was your dream? She said, I had a dream. I was on a beach and I had my three sons and there was this massive tsunami coming. And I said, guys, run, run to the hills because there's this, this massive tsunami coming. And so <clears throat> as it was coming, um, her three boys and her were running up the hill. The oldest one goes down under the water. She goes under the water and both of her son, her two youngest sons go under the water and she pops up and she's okay. Her oldest son pops up and he's okay. And each dream it's different. Sometimes the middle son pops up, but the youngest son, they can't find him. And sometimes the youngest son pops up, but the middle son, they can't find. There's always one of those two sons is missing. Mm -hmm. And of course she wakes up in a cold sweat and a panic and did my son drown? Where is he? Blah, blah, blah. And so that's the dream. So the first thing I heard is I heard a verse in Job. Job was a man, a very rich, wealthy man that lived that had a, a lot of kids and he had a lot of farm. And, and, and then he had a hard time. Go ahead. Yeah, he had a hard time. <laughs> one of the things that he was worried about is he wanted to make sure that his kids were safe and that they didn't die. And <clears throat> what happened is his family went through just unspeakable tragedy. And one of the things that happened was all of his kids died. Mm -hmm. And it says in scripture, what he feared came upon him. He feared that his kids would die. They died. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it's a lesson for all of us. But <clears throat> um, I, I, that's what I heard when this lady said, well, I had this dream, three sons, all the sons always fine. One of the two, the, the middle son or the youngest son, um, we can't find. We assume he, he's drowned. He's dead. And I heard what she feared came upon him. This lady is a single mom. I'm like, I can't tell this lady what you fear is going to come upon you, meaning one of your kids is going to die. Right. Like, relationship with this woman. Why should she listen to anything I have? To, I'm like, I, I, and I'm just hearing this in my spirit. And I'm saying, God, I can't tell this woman that she needs more information. I need more information before I would say anything. Mm -hmm. so the next thing I hear is ask her how old her kids are. 
thinking, what the heck does that have to do with anything? But I, I just listened. Okay. How old are your sons? Well, they're seven, 13 and 16. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I said, so it was between the seven and the 13 year old. One of those two is always missing. Yes. So then God said, ask her what happened between seven and 13 years ago. Okay. seemed like a fair question to me. What happened to you between seven and 13 years ago? She got really quiet. I'm like, are you there? And she's like, yeah. And she said, well, um, my daughter passed away. What she feared came upon her. She had already had a child that had died. And that was the intelligence that God was giving me. I thought, because I didn't know that. I didn't know her at all. So I didn't know that this had happened. So I thought maybe it was talking about the future, but it was talking about the past. This had already happened. She said, John, it was so painful. We got divorced over it. She says, I don't even talk about it. Like nobody in my life currently even knows I had a daughter. Okay. And it was a problem that she had been working through with, you know, a counselor or a, or a therapist. And I was able to speak into that part of her life because I had the dream. I knew a piece of information or truth about her that was very, very difficult. She didn't even talk about with anybody. And we were able to speak to that situation. And I think it helped bring healing to her. So it sounds like to me that it's, you're able to have these difficult conversations because you trust yourself and you trust what is being delivered through you that no matter, uh, you know, what the reaction is, which interestingly enough, it seems like the reaction is when you speak the truth and love, the other side is not offended. Right. Exactly. They're in fact, maybe even set free because now this secret can come out or this wound or pain can be released. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There was another guy, the, the same business guy, Emmanuel, that had the dream about the 10,000 fold increase. He came to, he brought his family to Texas where I live. And so he said, hey, come down. We're on vacation. I want you to spend the day with my wife and my kids. And, and so we're just hanging out, having a glass of wine or whatever, talking. And, and he said, you know, I had this weird dream about a year ago. And he starts t- talking all about these different things in a dream. They go to a certain type of restaurant. The people, there's two types of people that are having dumplings in this restaurant and they're of a certain nationality and there's this happening and that happening. And, and I said, did you have people of this certain nationality working for you last year? And he said, yeah, I had two consultants that were of that nationality. I said, did you fire them? And he said, how did you know that? I said, they were eating dumplings. I felt like you dumped them at some point throughout the year. And right. he was, yes. And then somebody brought out a silver teapot and was pouring, was supposed to pour him tea, but the only thing in the tea was hot water. Mm-hmm. Silver represents like 30 pieces of silver, like money for betrayal when they mm-hmm. betrayed Jesus. So I said, Did, was there a betrayal that happened that landed you in hot water? Yes, that was the deal I did with Canada. I had this partner and this partner. And, that. and so as I unpacked the dream, what happened is God told him a year ago, this dream, he had no idea what the dream meant. A year later, the year has passed. I'm telling him the dream and it's hitting every single Key high point. low point of what's happened in his business over the last year. Yeah. yeah the year where I fired the contractors. This is where the deal in Canada went south. This is where the betrayal from my partner happened. And it was just amazing. I said, isn't, isn't that so cool that God gave you this a year in advance? Not that you could know all of this was coming, but so that you could know that he knew and right. he foresaw all of this and he guided you through all of the terrible things you went through this last year. I think it's hard for people to believe sometimes, depending on their belief system, that there could be this invisible, unseen, yet powerful force guiding them, walking next to them that, you know, cares enough to tell them. There, there, a lot of people are doubters until- Because of the apathetic, I I just want to say, given the level of apathy sometimes we see in this world. Go ahead. Until it happens one time, what I tell any doubter is I say, give me the most vivid dream, the worst nightmare you've ever had, or the most recurring dreams, because I know those to be some of the more important dreams, because the divine creative is telling you over and over and over again, or telling you in a way that's very emotional and visceral. So it's Mm kind of like God turning the volume up on the message. So I say, just, you know, if you don't believe, that's fine. Give me the worst nightmare you've ever had. And they do. And I've had some doozies. I was, uh, I was once in in a public setting there were like 50 people in this class and I was asked to teach on dreams. And I said, I believe dreams come from God. And boom, a hand shoots up right away. And there's a, you know, a very, very good looking professional woman in the audience that's like in her mid forties. And she said, I had a dream. I was raped by my father. Mm-hmm. Are you telling me God gave me that dream? 
And I'm like, that's a really good question because if people think that God is going to terrify you with such horrific things at night, what are they going to think about God? Correct. And, and, and I didn't understand why, why would God give somebody that dream? That's a horrible. I would never want my daughter to have a dream like that. Are you kidding me? So I'm just like, okay, God, you're going to have to help me. And the first thing I heard was ask her how she felt. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be the dumbest, most insensitive question you could ever ask a woman who has either been through that or even had a dream. How did you feel when your father was raping you? I'm just like, God, I can't ask her that. And he's like, ask her. And so I put out a bunch of disclaimers. Hey, sometimes I'm wrong. I don't always hear right, but here's what Mm -hmm. I'm saying. How did you feel? And she said, you know, I was really annoyed. I'm like, wait a minute. You were annoyed. She's just yeah, I had other stuff to do. I just wish he would finish. You were, you were looking at your watch like, hurry up, I have laundry. And she said, yeah, pretty much. And I'm like, okay, so there's no trauma attached to it. Because I would think you would be traumatized or filled with rage or want to kill him or something. And it was just this exercise of whatever was happening. It was just something she wanted to, to be done with. And then all of a sudden in my, in my spirit, I see a picture of her heart. And there's a black spot, like a wounded spot on her heart, like a scar, and this loving hand moving towards it to touch that spot and to fix it. And every time it would get close, her heart would shrink away and pull back. Mm. And here's what I heard. I said, it feels like forced intimacy from the father, which a father raping somebody is a very graphic picture sure. Sure. Of intimacy from the father. And so I said, this is what I see. Here's what I'm hearing. I feel like God wants to touch a part of your heart. You won't let him touch, you know, and again, another hard truth. You won't let him touch it. It it feels like forced intimacy from the father. She immediately starts sobbing. Mm -hmm. She's like, you're exactly right. I know exactly what the area is. You're a hundred percent right. Thank you. I mean, it, it changed your life. And it was a difficult conversation to have because, you know, there's 50 people in the audience and they're looking at me like, how is this guy going to make this a positive thing. And I wasn't trying to make anything a positive thing. I just, I didn't know where it was going to go. And you don't, when you get into it, when you start in a great place. Yeah. I just wanted to speak for a moment into the fact that I think that one of the things that dream interpretation and what you can do, as well as what spiritual intelligence can do is break up what I call the crazy eight pattern or the loop around the airport where somebody stays in a holding pattern or they stay frozen. But when there is new information, new Intel, whether it's intellectual, emotional, or spiritual, that can break them out of it then not only are they set free, but they also can move on and they can evolve in their life compared to just what I call, again, staying in that crazy eight pattern of, you know, here we are again, and then we go back again and people can stay in that for years or decades until somebody can be strong enough or know the right words to say. And then, you know, that, that pattern gets broken. So, um, so I've got a couple more questions before we wrap. Um, why is a relationship with a higher source, a higher source such as God, important for our spirit in what is known as walking by faith compared to by sight? Well, I, that's a really good question. Um, I think if you look at intelligence, and again, the, the national security community, the CIA found this out in talking to my friend about remote viewing. Mm-hmm. If you only focus on technology that you know and understand, and you don't ever go past things that other people might think are, 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 are weird, like psychedelic drugs. If you don't try different things, and I'm not saying people should try that, but I'm saying, look at dreams, look at the divine creative. If Even if we don't understand it, if we're willing to go check it out and see if it happens, the first time somebody has a dramatic dream that is then proven to have germane, actionable intelligence on a situation in their life, like my friend Emmanuel, they're a true believer. Like the second you walk into a deal where the numbers are exactly the same, (coughs) 10,000 times greater than the numbers in a dream you had a week ago that somebody interpreted for you, they're hooked for life. Mm -hmm. So what what I think is a lot of times we try to, you know, we live in this uh, very much a motivational world where we believe it's all about striving and our own efforts. And if I work hard and I do good and I'm basically a good person, then things will work out. And that's not, that's been proven historically to be false. Right. It's one dimension of thinking. Right. There's so many people that have been harmed by bad people that other people that have it out for them for some reason, completely unknown to them. And they're trying to figure out based on their paradigm of relationship. I don't understand why this person is mad at me or wants to destroy my business or my life or whatever. And, and so they're trying to figure out, but if you can back up a little bit and say, I can't figure out this problem in my company, with my finances, with my family relationships, in and of myself, I need intelligence from an outside source. 
Mm-hmm. You're gonna ha- you may have to rely on something that's outside of your comfort zone. That you can't control or understand. Go ahead. You can't control or understand mm-hmm. <laughs> because you want intelligence that is outside of what you can see, feel, touch, and physically observe. Right. And that's the case. When that happens, again, even when the federal government went there, they found a, a treasure trove of information that they, they still can't necessarily explain how or why remote viewing works. The same thing is with dreams. And we've seen the same thing on the national level, right. advisors, advisors to presidents and people in administrations where policy is made and problems are solved because people are saying, well, we don't have the answers. We need a higher source to guide us. And when you have that level of faith or even, uh, even, if, even if you're not there, I understand people who are very antiquated to deal with dollars and, and all. My background is nuclear physics. It's mm-hmm. nuclear power. I've owned a finance company for 16 years. So I'm not some, again, incense burning, you know, new age freak that's out there thinking that we should all just say, um, all day long and we're, the answers will flow. No, like I, I, I have real world problems that I need solved. But mm-hmm. by what I found is that I can tap into this place of faith, like you said, that's not based on observable context. And I can get answers and solutions that are way beyond what I would have come up with myself. Well, and I think it's also humbling to have to ask for help, especially the more successful somebody is by worldly standards, to have to humble themselves. Yeah, and you know, that it, it reaches into the question of legacy. <laughs> if you believe that somebody, if, if you're, even if you don't believe, if you're open to the idea that somebody with an intelligent design created you, Mm -hmm. then you have to realize if you're a creator, anything you do, you create for a particular purpose. If you're a potter, you make a cup to hold water. You don't make a cup as an ashtray. You don't make a cup as a vase. The purpose of a cup is to hold that liquid so somebody can drink it. So if you think that maybe, maybe there's something that made me Mm -hmm. And if so, maybe there's a purpose of my life that's way bigger than just what I think and feel and beyond me. And if you can tap into that, you can tap into a destiny and a legacy that will leave an impact on this earth that will far exceed your lifetime by just asking the question, is it possible Mm -hmm. that I was created by an intelligent designer that still wants to communicate maybe even through the language of dreams? And I think that, um, that, that's incredibly important. And I think that if I, when I think about successful people, many times they have an alpha personality and control is hard. So a, a part of this equation means letting go of a little bit of control to consider outside perspectives. I just wanted to add that because as, as you probably are aware, uh, there are many successful people and with a variety of different personalities and a variety of different natures. Um, but there is an aspect of relinquishing control and not being in control in order to give the steering wheel for a moment to another voice. Um, What are the benefits of understanding the dream language and investing in a dream notebook as a part of one's legacy documentation? I believe it is absolutely invaluable to the point, like when we talk about things like legacy and financial inheritance, I went to my mom and dad and said, if you don't leave me any financial inheritance, the one thing that I want from you is please, please, please write your dreams down because I want a generational legacy of how, and I've even said, do you remember any dreams that your mom and dad have had? Mm -hmm. And they have. So I have a generational legacy of how God has spoke through dreams to my grandma and grandpa who are deceased Mm -hmm. to my mom and dad who are still alive. My dad sent me a dream the other day. That was a profound dream. It had to do with the stock market and the election and what's happening in America today. It was an incredibly profound dream. And then I have the dreams, 350 pages of the dreams that I've had. So I have a generational legacy of how God has spoken in different timeframes throughout history to my family, which is way beyond, again, when when we get outside of ourselves, you know, and going back to what you said is- Or service to self. Go ahead. Keep going. You know, don't wait for you to lose everything because, you know, with entrepreneurs, we go up and down and sometimes we're at the top and sometimes we're at the bottom. Don't wait until you lose everything and you tank everything and God forbid you you go bankrupt or things outside to to look outside yourself for answers. Mm -hmm. Like if you're well, if you're doing well and you're wealthy and things are happening in your life now, still be open to the idea that things can happen that that uh, happen outside of, you know, the 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 observable context, and it can go into the, the realm of faith. 
Absolutely. And I think one of the things that the next generation needs the most right now is more than just property and financial assets. I think they need these intangible qualitative things like you have mentioned, um, a dream journal from the parents, but also, you know, when we think about traditions and insights and educational lessons, you know, those are things that, you know, um, and I think the Judeo Christian scripture talks about this, um, you know, the, the material things can be washed away like sand. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you had even brought up, was it 1 Corinthians 13, if you would just speak on that quickly? Yeah, well, it says, it, it's it's the verse about love. It's spoken at a lot of uh, weddings, but at the very end, it says, now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. There's also another part of that same verse that says, now we see in a mirror dimly or through a glass darkly. And when we talk about glass, you think of like Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass or even right. a looking glass, the idea of being able to predict the future and looking forward ahead in time and, and getting actionable intelligence of events that haven't even happened yet that we can know of in advance. Now, again, we've had this happen at a national security level where we were able to send warnings up to two top intelligence agencies that's where we said this is a national security event we believe someone's life is in danger because we've gotten times, dates, locations through mm -hmm. dreams and we've confirmed them and not just one source that they've, they've sent up and people have at least taken the time to read the report that we've written, mm -hmm. whether they've changed policy or what, that's really not my job. My job is to just deliver, just decode them and provide the information upward. Right. But okay. yeah, so, so one deep question before we wrap. Um, okay. All right, so would you talk for a moment about generational bloodline callings and generational woundings? And the only reason I bring this up is because the conversation about letting go of any offenses against God. So if there is a wounding, we might be, um, we might have a brick wall that's up and only be somewhat conscious that it's there. I just wondered if you would touch upon that lightly. Absolutely. In fact, I'll tell you my personal story. It goes okay. back to, I started recording my dreams when I was in a relationship. <laughs> I was pursuing a woman. I really wanted to get her attention. Um, and I, I met with her nine different times, but they were cursory kind of introduction type of, of meetings and we didn't really go deep. Um, and, and then it ended up over a period of five years that I, as I continued to seek out this relationship happening, it didn't happen. She gets engaged and marries somebody else. So I said, this dream thing is stupid. I took all my dream journals, I threw them in a box to my closet, and I said, I don't want to have anything to do with dreams again, just like my friend that was an executive at Facebook. Same thing, relationship happened, frustrated, got their heart hurt, and said, I'm done listening to this stupid dream thing. I'm Rejection. Never... Rejection. And it wasn't until like two or three years later that somebody had a question about a dream, and they came up to me and said, hey, do you know anything about dreams? And I'm like, what? What do you want to know? Right. And I was really kind of dismissive about it because I felt like it didn't work for me. And as they started saying, well, hey, what does this mean? I started seeing things that they didn't see. And I started getting answers and I started decoding because I had a little bit of experience of hearing this language before. And then they would be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Now I know what to do in my life or in my business. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. And, and so the more and more people that would come to me and, hey, I heard you interpret dreams. And then they would ask me questions and and I realized that, you know, I had an offense that shut my dream life off for several years where I wasn't recording my dreams at all. And now that I'm back, I, I'm not offended towards God because this relationship didn't work out the way that I thought it would. Now I'm open to God, the Holy Spirit, the divine creative. And I'm saying, speak to me in the dream, the language of dreams at night, because I want to know intelligence beyond myself and what you have to say. So removing that offense opened up the whole dream world to me. And now it's one of the things that I do full time is spiritual intelligence. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is when a, a heart gets hardened. Mm, yes. Or one of the things that I see happening today all around the world is no matter somebody's successful level, if they numb out, and they might numb out through a variety of different ways. But then when they do, also that brick wall gets strengthened and then nothing can get through it in terms of their being able to transform or grow and so forth. Right. What would you like your legacy to be? Wow. There's a lot of answers to that. Um, I'm going to give you two of them. One is I want the entire world to be open more to the idea of the language of dreams. If I can point people to, look, just get a notebook, just take it on faith, get it in a notebook, 
write your dreams down, start asking God questions. If you don't believe in God, start asking questions and then go to sleep and then write your answers down. And then if you can't figure them out and you can't decode them, call me or get in touch with me or, or, or whatever, and let's talk about them. Mm -hmm. So I, I want the world to be more in tune with the idea of the possibility of solutions coming from a place other than human knowledge. That would be one. The Probably the second thing would be, uh, I want to leave a legacy that's greater than myself because I was able to tap into something that was greater than myself. And I think if we had a group of 10,000, 100,000, a million people that were open to listening to solutions from, from God and getting solutions and innovations into our businesses, government, our daily lives, our families, relationships, that I think we could dramatically change the world. In fact, what I would like to see is ancient councils of spiritual advisors restored to every world leader in every country of the world, because that's how kings did it back in the day where they would have wise men and astrologers and magicians and enchanters. And, and, and maybe we don't believe in all of that stuff anymore, but there's certainly things outside of the realm of observable scientific processes that if people take on faith, they can reach innovations and answers that they can't get anywhere else. And I think every country in the world would be better if they had a group of people like me that could advise presidents and kings and queens and prime ministers and heads of state when they had questions and problems that they couldn't solve in themselves. And they found themselves stuck, sure. Okay, right. wonderful. Um, is there any um, anything else you'd like to mention, like perhaps a book about spiritual economics or? Yes, absolutely. I have a book. Um, my, the first version of the book is called Occupy a Race Recession, Fund Your Dreams, Change the World. It's written by me, John Redbow. It's on Amazon. Um, <clears throat> there's an ebook format. Um, there, I think there's still some printed copies out there, but the updated, the revised version of that is called Blueprint: How to um, How to Fund Your Dreams and Change the World. Um, and so that that I just updated in 2019. I wrote the first one in, in 2012. Um, but other ways of staying in touch with me, those are more about biblical ideas of truth related to the financial world, but they also have to do very much with leaving a legacy and focusing on something that's greater than yourself as a way, by the way, of creating wealth. Um, but if you're interested in the, uh, the spiritual intelligence, I have a YouTube channel called Spiritual Intelligence Briefing. Um, I also have um, the Dream Lab on Facebook. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a friend of mine, we're gonna launch in the next week or so, a 21 day Dreams Through the Bible series where from a very, again, nuclear physicist kind of background, we're going to look at the dreams in the Bible and find out the lessons that we can learn and the paradigms that can help us in our own dream life to decode our dream life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think about, um, again, just to come full circle with the introduction, when I think about um, the intellectual intelligence that's available, the emotional intelligence, and now this is there's a spiritual intelligence that is available and, and also when somebody talks about walking by sight versus by faith, I'm aware that um, in the advertising industry with marketing that billboards are now going to have 3D holograms. So there's one industry that will tenfold or more increase what we are going to see with our sight. And I, I can only hope that we will also consider balancing out how we might feed our faith in order to walk by faith. Absolutely. Great, great observation. Okay, well, thank you so much, John, for your time. I very much appreciate it. I'm very grateful. And I hope that people will check out your YouTube channel as well as your book and consider what dreams as well as dream interpretation can do for defining, developing, and executing your legacy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Angelina.